You've heard about this place before. Time and time again, I come back to this region, this land that bestows the feeling of vastness, the immensity of space. A landscape tempered by the stillness of time, weathered by its glorious history, and then consummated by an enveloping shroud of silence. Admittedly, the sparseness here isn't for everyone, and yet only those who truly roam consider this a land that seemingly never ends. And that's part of its beauty, for anyone who appreciates the least explored, off the beaten path, hidden beneath the familiar. This place takes up one third of the entire country, and it's considered the heartland of Portugal. A place where the sun shines strongest in its historic hilltop villages, its open plains and rolling landscapes, a peaceful countryside and vineyards that are steeped in heritage and story. I've been here twice before, and yet something pulls me back here. Something about this untouched, unspoiled and unhurried rural life that captures me every time. The warmth, simplicity and unmistakable beauty of Alentejo. In the previous episodes, I've shown you Central Alentejo. From the ancient city of Évora to the magical medieval village of Montserrat. We've explored Costa Vicentina, the rough-hewn, beautifully unexploited coast of Alentejo Litoral. This time, I headed further east to the Portuguese frontier, sitting close to the Spanish border. This is Alto Alentejo, an absolute gem that must be seen to be believed. After driving through long country roads, our first stop is known to be Alentejo's white city, the luminous Estremoj. You'll know it immediately as soon as you enter into the town and ascend to the historic quarter, a living vestige of a medieval settlement hoisted up strategically to command this Alentejo plains. Here lies within this town a magnificent palace, where the medieval royalty of Portugal used to reside, primarily built in honour of the incomparable Reina Santa Isabel, the wife of King Denis. The real crown and glory is a fortress called the Tower of Three Crowns, an imposing 30-meter-high keep made entirely of local marble, cementing the region's reputation as Portugal's most significant source of marble. This tower itself, built throughout the reign of three kings, hence the name, is considered to be among the finest surviving pieces of medieval military architecture in southern Europe. We climbed up here during sunset to admire the incredible view, appreciating the vast Alentejana plains. Like the best towns in Alentejo, they're experienced well by foot, as you can fully appreciate the simple pleasures of walking around and getting lost around these streets. And while in Estremoj, you cannot miss the wonderful Saturday market of the lower town in Rocio, a market that runs all year round, giving you an experience of local Alentejo, combining second-hand market and handcrafted items. We love the fresh vegetable market and local produce here, 
with some of the best cheese and sausages available in this great region. The further we head east, exploring these rural landscapes, the breathtakingly sparse it becomes. It reminded me of what I love most about Alentejo, the absolute calm and comforting silence. On this trip we came across a place called Monte de Provenza, a little slice of heaven tucked in this corner of Alentejo. We stayed in this farmhouse-styled hotel, just outside Elvish, a place that's surrounded with nothing but nature, a vast olive orchard, a vineyard and a great expanse of green. This was a dream come true for the owners Maria and Joaquim, who welcome guests and experience what they call a piece of paradise in this corner of the world. In Alentejo style, we took our sweet time wandering around this area, tasting wine and tucking into local delights, and then ready to explore Elvish. Every time I set foot along this frontier of Portugal, the towns that punctuate here always leave me awestruck, and Elvish is one of the most daringly beautiful. I've read that the walls of this city, still intact today, was fortified in a manner in which every side of the town was protected, defended like an armour, in the shape of a star, when seen from up above. So much history has passed in this town. Not only the historic Templar Knights left traces here, but a succession of siege happened here throughout the centuries, making this one of the most protected places in the world. So protected that they also built the enormous Amoreira Aqueduct, that even in a protracted siege, the fortified city will never run out of fresh water. The town of Elvish and the fortifications here are all world heritage sites, and to no surprise, these are some of the most iconic masterpieces in the history of defence architecture, and including the two surviving satellite fortresses, these are considered the largest bulwark dry ditch system in the world. I had to see this from the sky, and by all accounts, these views left me breathless. In Alentejo, authenticity is well preserved, and so is winemaking. These lands are home to some of the most refined and revered viticulture in Portugal. We visited Herdade do Muchão, this vast 900 hectare estate that features some of the oldest vineyards in Alentejo, along with the sommelier Salvador Borges de Castro. We were graciously welcomed and hosted by Ian Reynolds Richardson, who showed us around the Muchão property and shared the story of his family. Significantly, it turns out that both Ian and Salvador are cousins, related to the Reynolds house, and it was delightful to witness both winemaker and sommelier share this connection through both family and wine. Mouchang is a story of winemaking that goes all the way back to the late 19th century with the Reynolds family, the British Thomas Reynolds and his grandson, John Reynolds, who back in 1901 imported the French Alicante Boucher into these vineyards and began producing the now famous heritage Mouchang red wine. You have the, the best you can see, yeah. or at least the original one. People didn't actually realize the magnificence of, of Alicante with, with time, with time. Mm -hmm. and being well treated in the vineyard. Because it was 40% of um, 
Napa Valley in 1929, 1930, 40% of Napa Valley was Alicante Boucher. It's quite amazing. And now it's zero, of course. It was the number one variety sold in New York because it was a train that used to go right the way across the United States and they used to sell grapes in New York. And there's some people are starting in Australia and California that are starting to play with Alicante again, okay. finally. It's, it's taken them 100 years. The grape variety of Alicante Boucher is indeed deeply embedded in Mouchang's identity, and it's been part of this story for over a century. Ian explained to us that little has changed here, and the secret of Mouchang is really sticking as close to tradition or tradition, and all the better for it. Winemaking here is still done through traditional methods. Grapes are harvested by hand, trodden by foot in these lagards, then pressed, filtered, and aged in these wooden barrels that have all stood the test of time. We implored Ian how Mushao stayed true to its values, despite the surge of modernity, the market competition and the diversification of wine varieties. And he says the key is simplicity. We're always spending our time saying, why don't we just do a little, this tinker there is so good, why don't we just do sort of 400, 500 bottles? So we've got a lot of things like that all the time, but it's, you have to be really disciplined to try and keep the thing down mm. to the same it has to be simple. So we've got Darfel, Pont and Mouchard, and that's it. The moment you start playing around, people like that simplicity is easy to relate to. Yeah, of course. And people just get slightly confused about what's what and what should be and how old it is or how good it is. So we're trying to keep things as simple as possible within mm -hmm. the sort of molds of Tadidi Sound. Although Mouchard isn't entirely averse to advancement, they take their evolution carefully by staying true to their soul. We have made an addition that Pont White is new. Mm -hmm. It started three years ago and uh, it was a Verdeille, it's 100% Verdeille. Mm -hmm. And the reason we did it is we found an old book from 1909, which is one of the first travel books ever written by a chap called William Coble. Okay. And he had a whole capital just on Marshall with a photograph of the old Mont up there in 1908. Oh, yeah, wow. it was wonderful. And um, so he did the whole capital, and in that capital he just went on and on about Verdeille de Marshall, Verdeille de Marshall, come on. And he hardly mentioned Alicante at all, you know, so it was all about Verdeille. And thus it gave birth to Pont, a delicious new addition to the range of Mouchard wines. But truly, there's no denying, as winemaker Hamilton Reich shared to us, when we speak of Mouchard, we speak about its legendary red wine. This is the most important wine we have from Mouchard. There is the Tunnel 34 also, yes. but the, the full expression of Mouchard Terroir is through Mouchard. What is the expression of wine is the expression of the grapes that we picked from our soils. And that's exact, exactly what we want. It's a, a low intervention wine, a handcrafted mm -hmm. wine, mm -hmm. where the viticulture and hand analogy is the simplest possible. Mm -hmm. And what we want is the full reflection and expression of this place. Mm -hmm. so what is Mushan? The guys here even share to us a little yet nonetheless significant detail in this adega. They share that at a specific time of the day, when the sun is at a specific angle and at its brightest, a camera obscura is formed through the keyhole, the shape of the Mushan cross. It's a glorious little detail that was just unforgettable. After that wonderful visit, we went away having learned so much about Mushan and more importantly, that this place has achieved some kind of timelessness by upholding the virtue and value of simplicity. With that in mind, we pursue this concept of simplicity by staying true to what we love doing, exploring further, climbing up the slopes of Serra de São Mamed and arriving in the city of Porto Alegre. Porto Alegre is known for its incredible altitude wines to accompany gorgeous food that's available here too. This area is also known as a mountainous part of northern Alentejo, a lot less drier, but more green, a part of the region that serves as a gateway to fascinating castle towns further ahead. Which leads us to one of Alto Alentejo's most remarkable sites known to this country. This is Marval. one of the most beautiful ancient hilltop towns I've seen in Portugal. A 
remote settlement that sits on top of a plateau of a granite mountain, almost cut off from the rest of the world. A town that remained unchanged since the Middle Ages. A place that makes you feel flown to a distant past. Marvaun sits at the highest point of Serra de Saint Mamed and has a local fame of being the invincible town. One can only imagine the entirety of this place is completely surrounded by walls, hence making it difficult to conquer and impregnable from the steep granite slopes, and historically speaking, protecting Portugal from the invaders throughout the centuries. From the castle, you can see Spain from a distance, which is roughly four kilometers away. And more importantly, this is a place where one can truly appreciate, with all its sweeping glory, the vastness of Alentejo, this hinterland of Portugal. Marvaun is indeed spectacular to behold, and it's even more exquisite in the sunset, making you feel you're at the precipice of a civilization, like leaving a familiar world behind. That's exactly how I felt while exploring this part of Alentejo. I left the familiar world to explore the dizzyingly vast, unexplored, unmitigatedly new terrain. And yes, it made me feel a little scared, a little lost. But every step of this journey, every thrill, every moment of joy, every exhilarating feeling of freedom was worth it so far. And what I've seen and felt in Alentejo will burn inside me forever. That the true magic of this place comes from simplicity. A simple life. A simple peace. Of the three countries I've lived in my life so far, Portugal is the place I've explored the most. And it's telling, because as I grow older, the more I realize how precious little time we have in this world. I must make the most of what's right in front of me. Not the past, not even the future. But here, in this place, that I treat and consider as my chosen home, where I persevere to do and create what I love the most. <laughs>